My name is Monk Rowe, and we're filming for the Hamilton College Jazz Archive in Rome, New York, <laughs> with Kent Jordan. Thanks glad for being here. I'm glad to be here. This, yeah. this is an honor and a, and a privilege. It really yeah. is. Uh, do you think of yourself as a flautist or a flutist? Well, you know, you get that question a lot. I think <laughs> uh, James Galway answered that question for everybody. You know, you're just a, a flutist. And every once in a while, you might flout. <laughs> okay, that's good. It's like the difference between a violin and a fiddle player. Right, right a violin <laughs> and a fiddle player. You know, most violins call themselves fiddle players. Right. Fid fiddle players. So, yeah. yeah, it's an interesting dichotomy there. I was talking to uh, Clyde Kerr mm -hmm. just now about the family tradition in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. It's unbelievable to me, mm -hmm. the, the number of families. It's almost like family of that would always have carpenters or bricklayers or you know, some families have musicians mm. that's an interesting analogy I've never really thought of it that yeah. way um, you know I guess in, s in certain areas of the country where certain livelihoods or occupations predominate mm -hmm. and obviously in New Orleans music has always been a dominant influence in terms of our culture and I think that's one of the reasons why families have evolved so because outside of my family, the Jordan family, where my mom grew up in a family of 16 kids, <laughs> if you can believe that, yeah. but everybody played an instrument and sang. Yeah. So it was a really great experience to come up with my father, um, you know, learning music in Crowley, Louisiana, of all places, with Cajun influence or the Zydeco influence, and my mom uh, learning to play the piano, uh, playing Beethoven and playing um, Schubert and Chopin which are, you know, some of her favorite composers. And so, um, in fact, it's really interesting because Alvin Baptiste, you know, the famous clarinetist, introduced my, uh, my mother and my father to each other because oh. he was seeing my mom's sister. <laughs> so, you know, it, it gets strange and, and peculiar, but, yeah, music is, is really a, sort of like, a, a, for lack of a better uh, description, a fulcrum in a lot of families in the world. Mm -hmm. It really is something that, that keeps us, I think, uh, focused on... Um, things that are really important. You know, when you see um, promo written about people, mm -hmm. uh, if you're from New York or you're from New Orleans, most likely the promoter or the people who write that copy are going to mention that, mm -hmm. especially if you're playing out of town. Sure. Does it mean something to you? Do you think it's important that you're from New Orleans for, as far as the way you play I think that's a, that's a really tough and interesting question mm -hmm. because what happens is is that sometimes you forget about other cities. Say, for instance, uh, Detroit, where people like Joe Henderson, mm -hmm. the Joneses, Elvin Jones, Hank Jones, and Thad Jones, Kenny Garrett, Ron Carter, James Carter, Regina Carter, Billy Mitchell. You're right, Blue Mitchell. I don't want to. I don't want to leave anybody out. You know, it's like New Orleans. <laughs> you know, I'll be here all day. I mean, and um, the funniest uh, analogy that I can give you with that is one time I was talking um, with Max Roach, and he said, "You know, the only person I know from New York is Sonny Rollins." He's the only one I know who is from New York, and everybody else is from somewhere else. Yeah. It was really, you know, really interesting. And uh, I don't know how true that is, but uh, I think other cities, in their own little way, have added to the music. Like a mm -hmm. Los Angeles is sometimes forgotten. You know, I was talking with the um, the great drummer Chico Hamilton, and he was telling me that um, in his class was Dexter Garden, mm -hmm. Charlie Mingus. Buddy Collette, <laughs> okay, right. and himself, you know, not to mention anybody, Ernie Andrews, mm. you know, so how can you, you know, New Orleans doesn't have a, a, a monopoly on, on great musicians, but I think in terms of sometimes the lineage, when you think about Louis Armstrong or King Oliver and all of these people, sometimes, you know, uh, in a peculiar kind of way, it's the beginning. And so it, we have influenced these other cities or, or the world. And so it, it's sort of like a special kind of relationship I think we have with other, mm -hmm. with other cities. When, before you left for, for Eastman, mm -hmm. we'll, we'll get to that in a minute, but okay. was there enough work for you as a musician in New Orleans? 
Yeah, it was weird. I mean, when I was in high school, I was playing with performing with Ellis Marcellus mm. at a club you probably are familiar with called Lou and Charlie's. I don't know if you're familiar with Lou and Charlie's. No. Oh, well, let me mention this yeah. in the uh, archives for yeah. you. Lou and Charlie's was a very interesting uh, venue. It was a club. It was owned um, by, oh, my good friend, now I'm drunk, Charlie Baring, who passed away maybe about six years ago. And Charlie was actually one of the uh, producers of the Jazz and Heritage Festival, mm -hmm. but he had a club when I was in high school. And people like Alvin Batiste performed there, Ellis Marcellus performed there, all of the, the local New Orleans jazz giants performed there. And that was my first baptism into jazz and playing, you know, like, can you imagine being in high school, playing with Ellis yeah. Marcellus and people like James Black on drums and all these wonderful musicians. And it was, I mean, I was like in heaven. I was like a like a child in a candy shop, mm -hmm. you know, like studying with Ellis uh, during the daytime and, um, you know, performing with people like Alvin Batiste. I was still, at that time, performing with my father. And, um, you know, they were bringing other musicians who love New Orleans, like Cannonball Adley. Oh, through. my hero. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> so I met Cannonball when I was in, in, in junior high. You know, and he was, man, he was, you know, it's just so down to earth, you know, sometimes you have this expectations of like, you know, when you think about somebody like Hannibal, you know, like a god, you know, yeah. but you meet him and he was just as genuine as his music was. And that's the thing that really impressed me about a lot of the musicians I met. Mm. Why the flute? Um, my cousins play flute and I started actually on the alto saxophone, as mm -hmm. you know, my father's a saxophonist. And for some strange reason, I never really had a connection with the alto saxophone. But I started on the out the flute first, switched the alto, went back to the flute, and there was some kind of connection that I actually made with the instrument the second time around. Um, and interesting thing about the flute is it's a really tough instrument in terms of holding it. And I tell that to a lot of young flutists, like who want to start playing the flute, like when they're in the second or third grade, don't start. Yeah. Start on a piccolo because oh. you have a tendency to grab the horn because it's big. It doesn't look big physically. Yeah. But when you think about it, it's really humongous. Yeah. And so when I go around and I see a lot of young students, I can tell, yeah, you started really early because you're grabbing the <laughs> horn, you're not holding the yeah. horn, you know, because you're struggling with it. And somebody, uh, you might remember this, came up with the idea of actually curving it around to shorten it. My daughter did that. All right. And yeah. the reason why is because, you see, you go from yeah. here to here, yeah. the position. And somebody figured that out. Yeah. And um, so basically, I had a lot of cousins who were great flutists. I mean, they, you know, flute at that time was an instrument that fit, it, fit in the marching band. Mm -hmm. um, there really wasn't a lot of like youth orchestras around that, during that time. So basically, you know, when you played the flute, you were going to play in a band, marching band, concert band. And uh, they really excelled at, at, at playing the instrument, and um, I learned a lot from them. And, uh, my father was very supportive because he played a little flute at the time because he was always, I mean, I remember him with the bassoon, the <laughs> saxophones, yeah, the yeah. oboe, the flute, because, you know, he would say, well, you never know what you have to play if somebody comes in town with a show, you know, I have mm. to double on all these different instruments. Right. And uh, so consequently, a lot of saxophone players who were doublers were, were also flutists in a way. And they always talked about it being very difficult because that, in actuality, the flute is closer to the trumpet than the saxophone in terms of the amateur, if you think about it. Mm -hmm. You know, because you have that open, kind of focus, centered yeah. kind of an amateur that you have to deal with. Yeah. And uh, in fact, I knew of a couple of trumpet players who actually doubled on flute and trumpet, which I thought was really interesting. interesting. Yeah. 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 And so you went through the whole um, the classical repertoire? And right, and went through all yeah. of that. Um, studied at NOCA with Ellis, but all, actually that was interesting because at NOCA, even though I played with Ellis, I was studying classical music, mm -hmm. and I was studying with uh, one of the principal flutists in the New Orleans Symphony Orchestra, Richard Harrison, and Richard was a product of um, Juilliard and uh, Europe, you know, studying independently in Europe with different people. And, um, you know, he got me ready to go to, to Eastland, and I went to Eastland and studied with Bernita Boy there. I'm sure you're familiar with Bernita mm -hmm. Boy, great flutist. And uh, it was really interesting because when I was auditioning to get into Eastland, James Gower had just accepted the offer to teach there. And when I was about to go, they said that, no, he was going to start concertizing. And, you know, <laughs> and, you know and I mean, he's, 
he was just on a verge. He was just being introduced to the to the American audience during mm -hmm. that time, and it was actually good that I didn't study with him because a lot of the flutists who studied with him said it was a nightmare because he was there for like maybe two weeks, and then they had to fly in all these other flutists from all over the country to study. So it wasn't no consistency. No consistency, yeah. and, you know, and, and you know, it, it didn't really last six months. So oh. it was a weird, weird kind mm -hmm. of a situation. But Bonita was a was a great instructor for me. Rochester was a pretty good music town also, wasn't it? Oh, man. Um, I used to go out, I forget the name of this place, where Bill Dobbins used to perform. It was a little club, not far from the, from, from the dormitories. It wasn't the Pith Pithod, was it? I think that was, that was way back. It was maybe. like, uh, it had a Prince name. Oh. It, it, it was just one of those places where we used to go and listen. And I used to listen to him because he was like really knowledgeable, especially in terms of Bob. Mm -hmm. Uh, and during that time, you know, as you know, he transcribed a lot of Keith Jarrett's music. Uh, he was very, in terms of influencing me, he was really interested in, at that time, trying to combine sort of like the, the new thing with the classical thing. And uh, Actually, on my senior recital, he played the Franck Sonata with me, mm. which is a, an incredible piano part. In fact, the piano part is harder than the flute yeah. part. Yeah. Uh, and it's one of those pieces that w that's weird because violinists play it, cellists play it, flutists play it. You know, it has sort of like that really interesting mm -hmm. um, flavor about it that a lot of people, when they hear it, they want to transcribe it, and, you know, for their instrument. And it was a really, really, I mean, monstrous part. And But he could handle it. And uh, I saw him for the first time, well, I've seen him a couple of times, but um, at the IAJE convention. And we got a chance to, in Long Beach, California, about... Uh, a year and a half ago and we were talking about you know how in music you, you really should concentrate on the instrument first and not really call yourself a jazz musician or a classical musician but really concentrate on the fundamentals because that's how he was taught I mean but this I mean he was very knowledgeable in terms of jazz did a lot of transcriptions you know did great arrangements mm -hmm. but he was he's really knowledgeable about the piano he really 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 is when you were at Eastman what was your thought about post Eastman? Well, oh. I don't know. I mean, you know, when you finish school, you have to gig, you have to find a gig. Mm -hmm. It was really interesting. When I was leaving school, a lot of um, my, um, my fellow alumni were getting, you know, um, offers to play in orchestras like the New York Phil and the San Diego Phil during that time and various orchestras. But what sort of influenced me was my teacher in New Orleans, Richard Harrison, told me something that I'll never forget. He said, Kent, just remember, if you want to be in an orchestra, it's like being in an army. You have to go where they go. There's really no. <laughs> and that sort of made a really deep impression on my consciousness because, you know, even though I love classical music and I love all music, I love to listen to all types of music, um, I wanted to be free. I didn't want to be in a situation where I had to move when somebody else didn't move because I really wanted to explore what music meant to me versus, you know, well, you know, getting ready to play two or three times a, a week, which is, you know, which is, I'm not knocking it, mm -hmm. but I knew f for me that wouldn't be something that I would enjoy over a period of time. And I really wanted to focus on exploring music. I mean, playing the type of music that I felt um, gave me um, joy, for lack of a better mm -hmm. word. You know, things that I really wanted to do, things that I wanted to pursue, and not necessarily, in other words, I knew that certain things had already been done, and they were like, you know, you take that career path of playing in a, a, maybe a smaller orchestra and getting good enough so that you can audition for a bigger orchestra and that whole thing. You know, there's a lot of people who burn themselves out in that kind of a situation. Mm -hmm. You know, and some people really enjoy it. But for me, you know, it's like, no, I just rather listen and, you know, check it out and, 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 and do some things that are a little bit different. When I look at most classical musicians and rehearsals and so forth, mm -hmm. they, I never got the impression that they were enjoying themselves. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, well, uh, maybe they're just not supposed to smile or something. I don't know. But it. That's an interesting observation. Yeah. And, but I, you know what? I can tell you about that. Because at Eastman, I mean, I had to do a lot of that. You know, like obviously play in, in operas and play mm -hmm. in, in the various pieces that we were going to perform for that semester. And basically, I think what happens is, is that you're always in a, prof 
a preparation mode. You're preparing, you know, to play. And so sometimes you can lose the spontaneity. And I don't think Mozart or Beethoven wanted that to happen. I think what they wanted to happen was, yeah, you know, learn the music, obviously. You have to learn the notes, but you have to get to the music some kind of way. And so what happens is you're constantly trying not to peak because you might only be playing this piece, you know, two or three times. And so if you're in a rehearsal situation, you know, it's like, well, how do you, how do you get to the point where it just happens spontaneously? Like, in, for lack of a better definition, like when a group of five jazz musicians are playing, you never know what's going to happen from mm -hmm. night to night. You know, especially if, uh, I remember like playing with Elvin Jones, and Elvin told me something that was really important when he was with John Coltrane. He said, you know, sometimes John used to just walk up on the bandstand and start playing. And we didn't know what he was playing, and we'd have to follow him. And we would play for hours and hours like that. <laughs> Every night. He said, really? He said, really? It was sometimes people think, you know, the music was rehearsed, and it wasn't rehearsed. He might bring in a sketch, and we'd have to follow what he was doing. And the music was very, very spontaneous, hmm. if you can imagine. You know, and I think in classical music, the problem sometimes is they lose that spontaneity. Mm -hmm. you see and uh, that's not to take away from the music but just think about it if you've been in an orchestra for 30 years and unfortunately you know you're not exploring a lot of new music and you're playing this, the the war horses every yeah. year you know you bring in the same soloist so you pretty much know you know you play that piece a thousand times maybe and it gets old you know and um, you really have to be careful sometimes what you wish for yeah you know, because there was, at the time, there was this, I can remember there was this big thing happening. I was, Pierre uh, Boulez was leaving the New York field when I was in school. And he was really trying to, at that time, you remember, introduce a lot of new music, a lot of new composers. And they got rid of him. Because, you know, the board was like, no, we want to hear our Beethoven. Three, we want to hear our Mahler. We want to <laughs> hear, you know, Brooklyn. We want to hear Brahms. And that's not to take away from their music, but... You know, now I know if Brahms was alive today, we'd be like, what are you guys doing? <laughs> really? You're I playing that so. again? You're playing that again? <laughs> I wrote that 300 years ago. Come on, you know, what's happening? <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't think <laughs> classical musicians would understand that. They, uh -huh. would, they would probably look at me like I'm really crazy, but, you know, I tell people all the time, if Mozart or Brahms or Beethoven or those guys were alive, they wouldn't be doing that. They'd probably be hanging out of some club, you know, trying to, yeah, I'm going to learn how to swing. <laughs> I want to learn how to play. Really? Yeah, let me check that out. I'm yeah. just saying, I mean, it, right. it would be with, with several the cutting edge because they were the cutting edge, mm -hmm. you see, during that time. Yeah. And sometimes yeah. we forget that. You know, we sort of lose sight of that, that it's great, great, great music. You can't take right. that away from them. But they were at the cutting edge, and their music wasn't really being played every night the way it's being played now. Mm -hmm. You know, so think about yeah. that. That's kind of strange. I sometimes have to remind myself uh, about people being sort of on the cutting edge when they're when they're young, mm -hmm. because I've I've had the privilege of of doing interviews with a lot of elderly musicians mm -hmm. now, and I forget that they were young once and that they were really ripping it up and mm -hmm. they were they were progressive and all that. Mm -hmm. it's, yeah, it's that's e right. It's easy to forget that. On the other hand. Sometimes I forget that people like your father mm -hmm. can put out a record like the, the last uh, <laughs> thing he did, Palm of Soul. Right. And he's like out there. Right, he is. Know? Yeah, well, that's his personality. Though. Yeah. See, and that's what I love about jazz. More than anything, or music, period, that at the heart of it, it has to express what your personality is really all about. Mm -hmm. Because genuinely, that's what people are checking out. I mean, they, I mean for the novice, who knows nothing about analyzing or being analytical, you know, they're not going to know anything. A dominant seven from a, you know, mm -hmm. from a, they don't. But when they see somebody really playing what they want to play and they can see that person really involved and there's something that they want to check out, I've seen that happen a thousand times where people saying, yeah, I may not understand it. I may not like it, but you know what? This person's personality is very engaged in what he's doing mm -hmm. so i'm gonna stay here and check out what's going on and i can really appreciate that have you found uh, a group of musicians or 
a format so far that best helps you get your personality out there? It's interesting. I do. Sometimes um, I have some, some things where I just do flute and strings that I've done some concerts like that where um, I play classical and jazz music combined, some interesting uh, compositions that I've done with a friend of mine who teaches at the University of California, Santa Barbara, Earl Stewart, who's a great composer and arranger and teacher. Um, and we talked about concepts that combine different idioms. And I have my own group where I sort of try to combine the acoustic and the electric combination because I think um, our senses go in that direction. You know, we can't really we can't discount the electric, what I mean by that, like the synthesizers and that type of sound in a way, you know what I mean? And I try to combine that in, in certain areas and even deal with things, dealing with vocals and voice, that type of thing. And um, for me, being a flutist, is, you know, there's not a lot of flute players or this music didn't evolve with the flute, saxophone, trumpet combination. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was always yeah. like people like Hubert Laws out there or Herbie Mann or um, who else am I? I don't want to leave anybody out, but just, you know, the flute is sort of like in its own way and kind of an oddball instrument in jazz. Mm -hmm. You know, it's never really been one of those type of instruments. People like it when they hear it. But as a as a a jazz bona fide jazz instrument, it's sort of always been, I think, relegated to like a sideline instrument. Yeah, it's usually been a second thing. Right. It, it's still like like uh, almost like you have to qualify it somehow. Mm -hmm. that, uh, but you mentioned some great people. I though, you know, I was listening to uh, your CD here, mm -hmm. um, Essence. Oh, okay. And I, I and I was <laughs> listening to it, and I said. I think Hubert Laws listened to you. Oh, no. <laughs> no, I listened to him. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. I've, he's been a great influence because yeah. obviously he, he had the training, you know, Julie yeah. and Julius Baker and all that stuff. And he was, he was an interesting person because he always explored um, pop music, um, jazz music, Latin music, classical music. And he was a great influence because he, in a way, his music always reflected to me interesting dichotomies because uh, you take a CD that he did uh, entitled Morning Star yeah. um, Rogers Grant great composition I mean beautiful arrangements by Don Savesky so he was always to me always trying to deal with the pinnacle of, of the music and really bringing out the best in uh, what he was playing during that time and I could really really I have a deeper appreciation for it now because I think a lot of times what happens in the in a recording type situation is musicians get together and say, okay, you know, we're going to do these tunes in two or three days. We'll play the heads, we'll practice our solos and run the tape, and hopefully we'll have a CD at the end of it. Mm. And I think very few um, musicians realize that, you know, you really have to deal with arrangements, you have to deal with color, you have to deal with sound, you have to deal with um, temples of tunes, how you want it to sound. I mean... That, I mean, I'm, I'm really at my best when I'm dealing with those types of things. Mm. <laughs> so, um, you know, um, that means he, he meant a lot to me in terms of my development. He really did. I'm trying to remember the name of the record. The Sunflower or? Oh, Wildflower. Wildflower with yeah. the strings? Exactly right. Oh, I, that's um, a beautiful. Well, actually, he gave me all of the arrangements off of that, that CD. Mm. And I performed them in things, I re tunes like Pensativa. John Murtaugh did, uh, Equinox, Motherless Child. He just called John Murtaugh and said, yeah, give him, give Kent the arrangements. Mm -hmm. And I perform some of those things when I do the flute and string combination. Mm. And uh, I'll, I'll send you the, the concert. I He's did it live. Yeah, great. Yeah, so great you stuff. can hear it. Yeah, great stuff. And he doesn't, uh, did I hear something? He doesn't perform in clubs anymore or something like no, that? No, he, he rarely performs in clubs. Yeah. You know, festivals maybe. You know, yeah. you hear C. Hubert. Um, I haven't talked, I haven't spoken with him in a while, but uh, I'd love to, you know, hopefully sometime maybe get together and we do something. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, did your f father anticipate and then encourage you to pursue music as a career? He teases us about that now, but I think um, in his own way, 
you know, for him to have all of us out here performing and doing our thing is, there's a certain sense of pride in that. What with any any family, you know, like you take with you know Ellis and his kids, you know Bramford and Wynton yeah. and Jason and Delphio, or you know, it, I don't know. I mean, I just think that parents are they say one thing, but they're behind the scenes they're still like pushing. You know, they want to see their kids do well. Any parent yeah. wants to see their kid do well. Yeah. And for us, um, I think. Again, going back to New Orleans, going back to traditions, going back to our influences, uh, how we were taught, what we were taught, and the way that we were taught, um, it's almost, if I can say this, I mean, it's just, it's just expected that you're going to be a musician. You know, you, you're going to, you know, you have to keep up the tradition. You have to keep following. You have to keep the, the path. Mm -hmm. for other musicians are going to be coming, you know, because yeah. the same was done for you. And so we sort of have this, for lack of a better definition, a tradition <laughs> yeah. that we follow, you know. Uh, hopefully it will become better because it's about making it better, you know. Obviously we've gotten a lot of recognition these, these past couple of years in terms mm -hmm. of uh, the musicians who've come from there. But in a lot of ways I think... Um, um, sometimes it can work against you because New Orleans has such a strong, you know, tradition and traditional music that sometimes it's hard to break out of that. You know, you take, you look at my father, you, in, in, if you didn't know he was from New Orleans, you know, <laughs> he's sort of like out there by himself in a way. Yeah. But um, to answer your question, I, I think, um, he, no, he really, he's, he, he never really discouraged us from doing what we wanted to do. He would, I mean, he spent a ton of money on private lessons. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, there's something to that. Right. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I want to go back to that bit you were just talking about, and the people may make preconceptions about you as a musician mm -hmm. because you come from New Orleans and you play jazz. Mm -hmm. Well, then you must play, Right. you know, what Basin Street yeah, Blues, Basin, all that. Um, and actually, that's really interesting because um, with a lot of people, and, and hopefully you'll get a chance to introduce, uh, well, interview Harold Baptiste. I don't know if you're familiar with Harold Baptiste. Mm -hmm. uh, but Harold was sort of like the person who was teaching Ellis and Nat Parallat and all these other people um, tunes that Charlie Parker, you know, was, was writing. I mean, he was a person transcribing in New Orleans saying, well, this is with Bird played, and this is the tune that he played, and this is my tune, and this is how this goes. And so he was the one influencing Alvin Batiste, Ellis Marcellus, Ed Blackwell, and all these other people. And it's really interesting, you know, because you just never know, you know, who's going to be the person with the invisible hand, you know, <laughs> behind the scene, you know, telling people, well, this is the music, you know, this is, this is the new thing, you know, this is, this is what's going on. Yeah. It's really interesting. Do you have a description of what it is you're trying to do with your music? Wow. Hmm. That's an interesting question, a description. I would hope that it would be fresh. I hope that, I, I think, for me, what I fall back on is what Duke Ellington said about music. There's only two types of music, good music and bad music. Mm -hmm. I really believe that to be true. And not so much bad music, but something that maybe you don't like. And I can, you know, there's all kinds of things that I may not really like that I listen to, and I'll check out like a student of mine or a friend of mine who may be listening to something. And I'll just listen just to make sure that I don't have any buffers that's not allowing me to experience what they're experiencing before I really, you know, take off my analytical hat or put my two cents in and say, you know, I really don't like that. Mm -hmm. Because sometimes we just have a tendency to react viscerally to something because we don't understand it, because we don't like it or because it may have rubbed us the wrong way. Um, so for me, the word, the words are, say, phrases, good and bad, and maybe um, just to keep it spontaneous. You know, the spontaneity in music is sometimes a very difficult thing to do. To keep something that you've played a million times spontaneous, 
That may mean to change the, the harmony or change the melody a little bit or to try to work the rhythm something, you know, a little bit different or even play it in a different key. Mm -hmm. You know, something that will enable me to find a piece of myself in that music so that I can convey it to the listener and or try to convey it to myself. You know, it's, it's really like a constant search. You know, if anything that I've gotten from John Coltrane's music is that he was always searching. You know, he might be playing something like My Favorite Things and or, uh, you know, <laughs> and you hear it one night and then you listen to it another night or you, li you listen to it on another CD and I was like, man, he found something new. Yeah. You know, he found, I mean, he really was searching for something. And, or, you know, when you listen to Miles Davis, you know, they hear that quality of, and, and the, the esoteric mind, you know, at work is really an interesting yeah. thing, you know. You do a certain amount of composing. Actually, what I've been doing lately has been, I'm not really a writer in that sense, but I'm, a, I'm sort of like a person who, who likes to analyze music a lot. Mm -hmm. I think um, sometimes we get lost in the nomenclature. Um, analysis is very important. I think if you can analyze, then you can compose. For me right now, I'm finding that arranging analyzing and practicing certain things. I mean, there's like certain devices that I know that work, that will work. And so the thing is, is to take those things that you know work and put them into some kind of musical context that will make it seem seamless. What I mean by that is like, for instance, if you're listening to Brahms, Let's say you're listening to the, the, the clarinet quintet. And that music is really perfect. I mean, perfection. And when you really start, and then sometimes, in other words, you analyze it and you say, well, wow, why, why is this fitting like this? Why is this, you know, but then at the same time, it's still emotional. You know what I mean? In other words, it's just not a bunch of notes put on the paper and he knows how the violin and the cello and the viola and all of these things are going to interact but how do you make music from these things and then get lost in it I mean that's what's interesting to me like if you're analyzing like a John Coltrane solo and you, you know you, you get all of the notes everything is lining up <laughs> yeah. but there was something very emotional about it, you know. And then at the same time, there's something that's very analytical about it. And so how do you bring those two things together so that they're very seamless? And that's what I try to convey to my students. So, you know, you really have to deal with the emotion, but you also have to deal with the analysis. The analysis is very important. Mm -hmm. don't, don't get too far away from the analysis. You know? Is it that same thing apply uh, in improvisation for you how much theory do you think a student needs to be able to improvise a lot you think a lot right. more you never can have enough hmm. you never can have enough um, because as you discover certain things harmonically that can happen um, and melodically see to me rhythm melody and harmony are one they're not separate you know we teach them separately but they're really one they're one movement together. They, they, they function as one. When you start to, to break them down into the different boxes, and that w that's when you start to lose it. Because there are certain things that might be happening melodically that has nothing to do with the harmony, and something, certain things that may be happening rhythmically that may have nothing to do with the melody, but when you put them together, they function as one, you see. And to me, that's the things that are really interesting. Like when you start discovering certain things about how harmony functions and how melody and all these things really come together, then they really become one because you're not thinking about them in separate mm. departments. You see, we, I can tell you from school, we, we learn those things wrong. You, you go to harmony, you go to dictation, you go to, no, you should just really, you know, and I'm, I'm sure there's some smart people who figured it out. No, it's really just like one thing that you have to really deal with. Put them all together so you can see how they're functioning together. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I mean, can you imagine if when Ravel wrote Valero that he was still thinking about, you know, 
16th century harmony and treatises in terms uh -huh. of, you know, parallel fourths and yeah. fifths. Uh -huh. Come on, I mean, he would have never wrote it. Yeah, that's right. You know I, Ooh, mean? I can't write that. No, you can't write <laughs> yeah. that. I mean, I can't have the piccolo and the bassoon, you know, in seconds because that's a dissonant interval. You know? <laughs> well, I guess that's the magic of it, though, those, those moments when people find things that didn't work before. And mm -hmm make something out of it. Oh, yeah, and that happens a lot. I mean, I'm still discovering things. Um, I mean, we were playing like a tr uh, uh, Kurt Wilde's tune, a Kurt Wilde's tune today um, and, um, at the jazz camp, and we were, I was trying to find a different harmonization on Mac the Knife, you know, that would keep it fresh uh -huh. than what people would play. I mean, you can take even very simple things and find from your, you know, your analysis, well, this is what we'll do differently to reharmonize this and still make it beautiful but make it subtle so that when people hear it you know they won't even know that you reharmonized the tune yeah 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 well, i i um uh, i brought a little example of you here oh okay oh, oh which one oh, oh, i don't know what do you think you could guess what i picked <laughs> you probably picked something like a fair question did you pick uh thelonious monk as well you need I can't believe it. You're psychic. You're psychic. Why didn't you do it fast? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. Okay, now I have to, <laughs> first of all, like, how did you do that, but um, were those changes, I mean, those half-step things right. going back and forth mm -hmm. pretty darn quickly. Right. Do you find a, somehow try to find a, a scale or a sound that mm -hmm. fits both? Yeah, and, and that gets back to, again, my analysis, you know, like when you analyzing harmony, or the melody, see those things fit together. I mean, in other words, if you're just thinking about it, okay, going down in half steps, you know, you, you'll miss it. Hmm. Um, dominant sevens, by, the, by, the, by their very nature, uh, in other, I don't know if I'm getting too, they're really interesting when you think about them because they have different qualities about them, and the dominant seven especially, you know, when John, when John Coltrane was dealing with them. They had, like, to him, three qualities. They could be minor sevens at certain times, a function as minor sevens, or minor nines, or elevens. And then you could use them um, in terms of half diminishes. And then, you know, you can use them just in terms of, this, because they're actually a major chords. And then they have a dichotomy about them, because mm. if you're just dealing with a dominant seven, they can be major and they can be half diminished. If you think about it, you know what I'm saying? If you just think about C, E, G, B flat, you know, you have C, E, G, which is the major chord, and then G, B flat, you know, G, E, G, B flat, which is the half diminished. And then if you start extending them, then, it, you know, they have minor qualities about them. You know, like, say, for instance, like, uh, I remember when I was analyzing Blue Train, and there was one passage on a, on a, on a um, like a C7 type of chord where John played um, a minor 11. And so he played, like, B flat, D flat, F, A flat, E flat, G, right? And so I was starting, I started to analyze, and I said, well, wow, well, B flat is the seventh. The D flat could either be, you know, the flat nine, the F is the eleventh, the A flat is the sharp five mm -hmm. in relation to the dominant seventh. You follow me? The C yeah. is the tonic mm -hmm. again. The E flat is the sharp nine, right? Uh, well, no, am I leaving out? Um, e flat. G, well, you know, goes back to the uh, being a fifth. So basically, he saw where a dominant seventh, if you started from the seventh, a running, an arpeggio from the seventh, you could have this, these extensions that 
function as a minor 11, but against the dominant 7. Mm -hmm. You follow me? So that was very important to him, like, like to find those different functions and, and, and to make sure that, you know, you could use that as sort of like a device. Now, when you listen to him play it, it doesn't sound like that. But believe me, I know for a fact that that was something that he discovered. You know? uh, that was, you basically answered my next question yeah. then. Mm -hmm. But that wasn't an accident for oh, him. Oh, no. No, I mean, he really understood how they were functioning. So you could, um, you know, like, in other words, like sometimes, you know, in theory, somebody might say, you know, when you play a dominant seven, you can play this scale, you can play that scale. And you can. There's all kinds of scales that you can play against these things. But what you have to find out is how they're functioning what their true function is in the context that you're trying to deal with it, you see? And when you start analyzing like that, then you come up with different, you come up with like what I like to just define as the line, you know, like the connections between all of these different things. Well, I'm not quite sure I understand what you mean by how they function. Mm -hmm. In other words, like, you know, form follow function, like, you know, you've heard that mm -hmm. a million times from architecture. Well, architects, it's the same in music. You know, it does. And in other words, um, given that context, the dominant seventh was really functioning more for him like a minor 11. Mm -hmm. You see? It was so, sounding. It if you think about that, in other words, if you, if you think about a dominant seventh, right, a C seventh, but now think about it as functioning more like a B flat minor 11. Mm -hmm. Okay. It's different. Yeah. It's a different sound. Yeah. So in other words, you may not play C, E, G, B flat or some variation of a, of a, a sharp 11th or a flat 9. Now you're talking about, you know, well, yeah, B flat, D flat, F, A flat, C, E flat. You know, yeah, now you, uh, you see what I mean? You have, you have like another color that you can yeah. actually deal with. Yeah and a different function that you can actually do. If you're doing that kind of thing, do mm -hmm. you feel compelled mm -hmm. to sort of then bring it back to something that sounds less out? You know what That's I mean by that? I mean, some people play, would play sort of outside the change mm -hmm. or add all those right. things on, and then they would sort of bring it back as mm -hmm. if I went out there, but I'm going to bring back no I don't, I don't think so I think um, you know in other words that's the thing in other words the more that you can make it sound like it's not out or in or whatever the more that you can make it sound like it's a part of it then you're doing your job okay. because sometimes what happens somebody will play something and it's obvious that you know they're playing it I mean like think about a lot of the things that Charlie Parker played I mean he would play a lot of things where um, you know he would play like a half step above and then resolve it back you know mm -hmm. To create that tension, so it wasn't like he was playing it out for the sake of playing it out, but it was like, well, this is what I'm hearing. I'm playing it because I'm hearing it this way, mm -hmm. versus just saying, okay, well, I'm going to play against it, you know, play it out and keep yeah. it out there. And then, you, but then you have somebody like my father who will just keep it out <laughs> as far as he can, <laughs> and that's his thing because see that fits his personality. You know, you can play. Man, I mean, I remember him listening to Squeaky Doors when I was a little boy. So trying to find a, you know, he was talking about quarter tones and playing between tones before I even went to school. So wow. it was like, so, you know, I got an indoctrination into John Cage and Roger Sessions and, well, you know, Stockhausen. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, you see, my, my beginnings was like when with John Coltrane, and I remember my dad having Miles Davis doing a Sorcerer and John Coltrane playing Out of This World, and you know, um, I remember very vividly this this composition of this, um, this composer, American composer Henry Brandt. Brandt, I think you know, Devils, Angels and Devils, this flute choir, mm. really interesting piece. You know, bass flutes, alto flutes, piccolos, all kind of flutes. I mean, really interesting sound. So, you know, he's been dealing with the sound of music for a very long time. Because, it, I mean, when you're dealing with rhythm and sound, you're going to come up you're going to come up with something interesting. I don't care what what kind of music you, you deal with, you know. If you're dealing with rhythm and sound, you're going to come up with some interesting things. Think about, I mean, how Duke Ellington was composing for his orchestra, you know? It was really Yeah. 
I haven't. I I actually haven't really studied his his compositional techniques yet, but I've been meaning to get to it. I just want to just deal with the things that I've been doing yeah. so far. <laughs> yeah. Well, what is, what's it like to try to make a living in music, in the music these days? And has Ooh. it changed a lot that Man. that you would think in the last 15, 20 years? Oh yes, def very definitely. I think part of the problem that has happened with music, especially jazz music, and probably all music. I mean is that it's really publicity oriented now. You know, it's like somebody may know your name or they may know who you are, but they don't know your music. I'm telling you, I mean, I've seen it a thousand times. You know, like, well, obviously, like, take his, somebody who's famous as Wynton is right now, you know, in jazz. And it's, oh, yeah, I'll, you know, go to my friends. Oh, yeah, I know who Wynton Marcellus is. I know who Wynton Marcellus is. And I say, okay, really? Yeah. At least they may know, you know, that he plays a trumpet. Mm -hmm. I give him credit for that. And I said, well, you know, do you know any of his compositions? Do you know a, a CD that he may have made or any of his music? And he said, no, I may not know that, but I know who he is. Mm -hmm. Whereas before, you know, maybe people would say, yeah, well, I can name this composition. I know this CD. Or I went to the place or the performance or the club or, and heard this music. It's it's not the same, you know. I think people have a but now with with soccer moms and you know I'm a father myself and kids going to college and all these other things that people have to deal with on a day to day basis. It's very difficult now, I think, to deal with cultural issues. Culture now is well, you know, is it. You know, a mother and a father in a home, or two women in the home, or two mm -hmm. men in the home. Mm -hmm. That's quote unquote a cultural issue now. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, is it that you, you know, uh, what's another cultural issue? You know, I'm trying to think of the things that have sort of been put out there as Americans losing their culture. You know, uh, it's more a political kind of a culture versus yeah. a, an artistic type of a culture. You, yeah. You, you know what I mean? Abortion or pro-abortion. Abortion, abortion pro-abortion, all yeah, kinds of yeah. issues, war or not yeah. war. Whereas yeah. before, I mean, maybe you were dealing with those things in very subtle ways, but I think, you know, parents made sure that their kids went to musical performances, whether that was jazz, classical music, or whatever. They went to movies. You know, they weren't buying DVDs or videos. You know what I mean? Even it was though more of an event to, to go Exactly. Out, it know. was event-driven. Yeah. Now, you know, with the advent of the Internet, which is good because I love the Internet in terms of sort of like the, the universality of it, but in a way because of the mass communication of things, because we get our information so spontaneous now and so quickly now, we've lost what it really means to go to an event or to go to a happening or to see something new and different. Just because there's so much information out there and people are dealing with life in a very... How can I say it? Anticip and you know, like it's sort of like it's on the edge all the time. You know, you can't really mm -hmm. get a chance to really relax and enjoy yourself as much as you can. I mean, I have this this thing that I say like <laughs> sometimes when I'm telling my musician friends about doing certain things, and um, you know, it's like um, somebody can work in a corporation, and they're like, I don't want to, you know, like deal with the, the, the office today. I want to go and have a nice meal, you know, find a babysitter for my kids, <laughs> go to a movie, go listen to some music, and just chill. And then they go to the club, and the musicians are like, man, I don't want to be here tonight. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know? <laughs> so, you know, it's like the, the, the office, the, the executives are trying to get away and the musicians are trying to get away at the That's same right. time. <laughs> I know exactly what you're saying. I had, we had someone at Hamilton the exact same thing. I won't mention names, but a, a working jazz musician who mm. we really, we were thinking, that's what we want to do. Right. And he's thinking, I want your gig. Right. I want to get a college gig, you know. Right, and, right. And have yeah, that because, security and all that, yeah. whatever that. You know, because the, the road gets tired and, you yeah. know, maybe playing, you know. You, you, I'm telling you, it's, we're at a crossroads in our culture now. I mean, we have to really make a decision in terms of who we're going to be and what we're going to be and how we're going to be. And... Um, 
it's out there. You know, we really are. We're there now. So somebody has to come forward and say, or certain people have to come forward and say, well, this is really how it should be. Mm -hmm. You know, and not necessarily for everybody, but this is how it is for me. I still want to perform. I think, you know, the interesting thing about the Internet is I think it, what it will do is it will make people performers again where you just can't go and buy a CD and think, you know, it's nice to listen because I, the interesting thing about when I listen to this is I remember being in the studio with Ron Carter and Jack DeJohnette and playing with those great musicians. Yeah. I mean, so, and we were like, we know we did that in two takes. That was it. We rehearsed it and then they said, okay, let's hit it. Yeah. And so you have to be on it. You know, you have to be ready to play. You can't be around there saying, oh, you know, no. I mean, they were, they were pushing me and I love them for that. And, and that's what I'm talking about, you know, get back to that thing where, you know, forget about the CDs. The CDs are nice, but where you're playing live and the music is spontaneous and let the event dictate the music, mm. you know, and, and make something happen. You, before we actually started, we were talking a little mm -hmm. bit about how marketing is changing, has mm. changed, and will continue oh. to change. You had a, a release that kind of sat around for a while, mm -hmm. out of this world? Out of this world, that's yeah. right. I have to get that to you. Uh, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry I didn't bring any of that, that music with me uh -huh. because I was just really just concentrating on what I had to do here. Yeah. Um, yeah, I did it, and uh, it was a really, I think, probably one, like my some of the best playing in terms of what I wanted to convey. Mm -hmm. And obviously we did Out of This World. That was influenced by John Coltrane. Uh, it's not his composition, but we... We, um, uh, I say we, but Elton Heron, who's a great colleague and a friend um, and a relative, <laughs> mm -hmm. arranged it for me. And, um, you know, it's just one of those things that, one of those sessions, Oren Keep News helped me produce it. And we, you know, it's just one of those things that um, I felt like after the tape stopped rolling, I gave everything that I, I could give at that moment. And I had to go on to something, you know, else. And and with the recording industry changing now, you really sort of have to pick your moments when you want to go in and do something that's of value mm -hmm. versus let me go in the studio and do a CD because I don't want people to forget about me. <laughs> I don't uh, really operate like that, you know. Uh -huh. uh, you know, just come up with some tunes. For me, it's more of a of a of a process. And then when I'm there, I'll know. Well, yes, let's let's go in and, and do something. So you're going to try to uh, market that yourself? Yeah, I mean, I just think it's, I hate to say this, and maybe, my, you know, I hope the archive proves me wrong, but I think, you know, CDs are over. Records are, will become for collectors. I think we're going to be dealing with sound files. I think that um, with the advent of the Internet, you can find your audience or you can find your consumer without having to, um, put a lot of money into it uh, without having to um, do anything differently. Hmm. I think the companies are realizing that now. I think, you know, they're trying to figure out, well, how do we keep this thing afloat? And I just think it's, for jazz anyway, I mean, we have to find our own audience now. We have to recreate that thing because the sales just aren't strong enough to support these labels out here to do these, you know, the amount of music, in other words, to support the kind of sales that they have to to make to support their, their labels. Yeah, their yeah. investment. I mean, it's, it's obvious to anybody who's... And that's a good thing because I think it makes us more independent. You know, I think the music will be stronger. Um, it would be. It should actually be more adventuresome. You know, it should be different. I felt what happened in sort of like in the, in the late 90s and in the early 80s was and I'm sure that you found this to be the same thing. There were so many CDs that were coming out where they were all the same format. Mm -hmm. Anybody, very few people were trying to do different things. And, you know, it was like trumpet, saxophone, rhythm section. Maybe vocals, you know, yeah. <laughs> rhythm section. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, you may have somebody who might have been adventuresome and did something with strings or try to put a different combination together. But I found, like, the sameness to be so... I mean, they found a formula that sort of like worked and then everybody was sort of like on that same mm. thing. And that, in a way, I think, um, not destroyed it, but it was sort of like a missed opportunity. Because think about it, I mean, 
even when Blue Note was at its zenith, you could pick up a Dexter Gordon record and know it was Dexter. You could pick up a Wayne Shorter record and know it was Wayne. You know, you pick up a, a, a Hank Mobley album and you knew it was Hank. Now, man, I'm telling you, I listen to like a lot of these saxophone players and I'm like, man, I cannot tell, you know, if it's Michael Brecker playing or if it's Michael Brecker playing or if it's Michael Brecker yeah, playing. Yeah, right. <laughs> no, okay, why, that's well, a joke. <laughs> why is that? Because, I mean, you know, what happens is, A person is not really searching for their sound, you know. I mean, as much as John Coltrane loved Dexter Gordon and Sonny Rollins, and and he would tell you he loved everybody because he was influenced by all these people. I mean, you know, I I'll never forget he was somebody was interviewing him and he was saying, "Well, who's your influences?" And he said, "Well, I love Dex, you know, Dexter, and I love Sonny Rollins." And he said, "Really, everybody. I mean, there was nobody that did not influence him." Mm -hmm. And I remember my father telling a very poignant story. You know, he said he and John were in Detroit one night, and they went to, around the corner to go hear Junior Walker play. Oh. And he was like, he said, man, he said, John Coltrane was like, man, how does Junior Walker play those high A's on his back like that? He said, I give, <laughs> yeah. I give my left arm on the plane. Yeah. Yeah. You know, a high, I mean, just so effortless, you know. And say, how does he do that? You know, so he was checking out Junior Walker. He said, I, I mean, you would never think that. Right. But that's, how, that's the kind of musician he was. You know, he wasn't this person who said, you know, as great as he was, he realized his greatness came from everybody, his influences. Mm -hmm. So he never wanted to lose that, you know. And uh, I think now what happens is, is like these kids are so quick and, it's, and they grab concepts and they go to school now. You know, like you said, you have the fake books, you have the transcribed solos, you have all of this information but you lose your identity. And it's something that you have to really be careful of because when I was coming up, we had to transcribe solos, but you know, we wrote them out and then we did the whole nine, but it was more for an analysis versus, well, I want to sound like John, mm -hmm. or I want to sound like Hubert, mm -hmm. or I want to sound like whomever, Miles. We did it because that's how mus musicians learn off the CDs or, yeah. or, or during that time, LPs. So you play along with the record, you learn it, and then you, in a way, you morph into your own thing versus, you know, verbatim. And, um, you know, Michael, you know, Breck is a friend of mine. He said the same thing. He was telling all, a lot of the young kids, man, don't, don't play like me. <laughs> uh -huh. Find somebody, you know, find your own voice. You know, find what you need to, to deal with. You know, mm -hmm. don't, but don't, you have to find your, your, your thing that makes you feel good. You know, and sometimes it's, that's a very difficult thing to tell young musicians that they have to find their own voice. You have to start mm -hmm. working on it very early. You think that uh, we're, we're turning out thousands of jazz degree holding musicians mm -hmm. every year now. Mm -hmm. What are they going to do? Well, that's an interesting thing, and I thought about that a lot. Um, there's an interesting um, theory in the stock market, if you, if you know, if you, you, you ever dabble in that. And that theory is all of the information is already priced. Everybody's getting the same information at the same time. So the means is always, <coughs> excuse me, is always constant. There's no new information being introduced. So the only way that you can really make money in, in the market is you have to make it by mistake. Somebody has to make a mistake. Mm. You, see what I'm, you see where I'm going? So all these degrees that are coming online, like you're saying, is basically everybody learning the same information. Same information, same information. I mean, you can check it out if you want. I mean, mm. just go and say, what did you learn at Berkeley? What did you learn at uh, UC? Or what did you learn in Miami? What did you learn? What did you learn? What did you learn? Consequently, you'll be surprised, and I've done it. I mean, in an anecdotal kind of a way. And um, basically, everybody's learning the same information. Now, there's something good in that, but what you have to do is, is you have to sort of take that information and how do you take that and make it your own thing? See, why, in other words, there's no accident that Monk is different from Duke Ellington, even though they learn the same thing. Uh -huh. Or think about it. Think about Ray Garland, Wynton Kelly, Bill Evans, Stan Getz, 
you know, I mean, you could have like that was so such an interesting thing to me because they were learning the same information, but wow, I could tell Dexter from Sonny, from Train, from Sonny Stitt. You know what I mean? But now it's like it's a really weird conversation. And I think it's it's affected the music and in that the consumer or I should say the novice or the neophyte, when he listens, he can't make that subtle distinction between a Sonny Rollins or a John Coltrane or Hank Mobley or Michael Brecker anymore. It's like it's a saxophone. It sounds the same to me. Oh. Uh huh. You see what I mean? Yeah. Well, it's a saxophone or it's a flute. It's, it's that. I'm telling you, I've, I've seen it a thousand times. You know, well, no, that's just an alto saxophone. Now, whether it's Cannibal Adderley, Dave Cobb, Donald Harrison. Try it yourself. You put on, I don't care, you can put on a thousand CDs for, you know, some of your, your, you know, like people who really don't follow the music. Or people who follow the music, and I'll guarantee you they could not tell you. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, like, the newer stuff, who it really is. Yeah. I know, man. I, I, I was listening to a CD, I don't want to mention any names, and I was saying, man, I can't, I, I really could not discern who it was. Whereas before, I'm telling you, man, you put on a CD, I can tell you, Joe Henderson. Put it, I mean, three notes, mm -hmm. I knew it was Joe Henderson. Three notes, but I'll fail. Three notes, I knew it was John. Three notes, I knew it was Sonny Rollins. I didn't, it didn't take me like a whole entire tune to figure out who was performing. Hmm. Now you put it on, I'm like. You know what I miss uh, <laughs> partly uh, that I think had something to do with learning about people is reading the back of record jackets. That's exactly right. You know, mm -hmm. somehow you got more connected to that. You got more connected, exactly. You, the whole was part of it, right? And thumbing through, and you could stand in the store and read the back of it too, you know. And, and that was part of the educational yeah, process. Yeah, that's right. You see, so now you lose that connection. You lose these little subtleties that sort of like the glue that holds all of these things together, and so it, it just becomes like this constant little thing that just happens over a period of time, and maybe. You know, we have to think about reinventing the music in another kind of mm. a way where, you know, something about it, I think, when it became, you know, more like a cultural, artsy kind of thing where it lost that connection between the people, sometimes mm. those things can happen. Mm -hmm. You yeah. know, where, I mean, you go, to, you go to an art, you know, you go to like a jazz club now, man, you're not going to see as many black people as you saw like 20, 30 years ago. You know what I'm saying is the truth. You go to concerts now, you know. Yeah. I mean, I'm just telling you the truth, man. I, I mean, know. it's just what it is. So you've lost that connection with the community, you know. It's, and we have to get back to introduce. It's not foreign, you know, like some of the, the hip hop, you know, artists, if you want to call them that, or acts, or whatever you want to say, they know about it. I mean, in a way, because they sample it, and they're trying to figure it out, because they're not really creators of music, they're samplers of music. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not trying to knock them, but. Believe me, they're not trying to analyze <laughs> a John Coltrane solo. They might like it and say, I can use it uh -huh. in their own little way, but they're not trying to figure out, you know what I mean? Giant steps, or <laughs> countdown, that's not their thing. It's what it is, man. Yeah. <laughs> you know. Well, I'm curious if you um, ran into any, you've been teaching at NOCA and, and that kind of thing, did you run into any academia, political type things once you get into well, actually education? I, yeah, I did. Actually, I, I quit NOCA, and I'm, now I'm starting like another arts-based school. Oh, um, uh -huh. Well, I should say, I'm sorry. I resigned. That's politically more correct. Yeah, yeah. And I, actually, Alvin Batiste took my place when I left NOCA. Um, and I feel like there's two things that should happen when you, when you talk about academia. Part of it is that when you get into academia or in a, uh, in a situation where you can teach, you should try to practice more and study more mm -hmm. and play more, even though your time is dedicated to obviously teaching. Now, the reason why I say that is because you can, you can lose your edge versus even when you're performing more, you, you see what I'm saying, you should study more and do those other things just because you're out there every night, maybe on the road, or you're playing a little bit more, and you, you lose the edge in terms of the, 
the analysis or trying to think about things differently just because now it has become playing every night or traveling yeah. or whatever it is yeah. you're going to do. So that's trade-offs. So in terms of the academia, I think the political thing is, is that um, everybody's trying to figure out what they can offer that may be a little bit differently from the other arts-based type things, you know, mm -hmm. if you're at the high school level. Right. Obviously, when you get to the college level, it becomes about, well, you know, if you have a Kenny Barron or if you have a Wynton Marcellus or whoever you have, or Terrence Blanchard or whomever you have on your staff or as part of the faculty, people are attracted to that. But I find, you know, there again, really, it's really, if you really get a great teacher, somebody who can really, you know, somebody who can teach you your instrument, somebody who can point you in the right direction, if they don't know the information and saying, okay, well, why don't you go check out this because I've heard this the other night or I've read about this or this is something that you mm -hmm. may find interested because you're interested in this. You know what I mean? Yeah. To me, that's what's important, not that you can think of another class to offer because it sounds good in your, in your course offering, but to really come up with people who really are knowledgeable. And what I mean by that is where they can point you in the right direction. Because nobody has a monopoly on, on information. I mean, mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, as great as Berkeley School of Music is, there are things that, you know, that's probably being lost in the cracks that, you know, where they can offer. You know, find somebody or find something where somebody's doing something a little bit different. And sometimes even at these smaller institutions, you know, like what you guys are doing. I mean, I don't see this happening, mm. you know, at Harvard or... Yeah quote-unquote, you know, institutions that have, you know, jazz degrees. And right. All you know, right. see, I, I'm, I'm really, I pick up on all of those type of subtleties because um, we have a tendency to, to, to just look at the big picture and not look at what's really happening. Mm. Yeah. What's happening in the near future for you after you? After this, uh, I have to get back because I was um, my, uh, the CEO of my school. It, well, obviously, I'm from New Orleans, so you know about the transition yeah. that we're going through. Yeah. Um, I was fortunate I didn't lose my house. I lived in a section of town that was actually uh, was settled before New Orleans. It's called Algiers. Uh, some people refer to it as old Algiers, and we call it Algiers Point. It's across the river. Across the river, yeah. And as you know about the history of the music, there was a lot of jazz musicians who settled in Algiers mm -hmm. to perform. I mean, we have this Walk of Fame. In fact, there's a statue of Louis Armstrong right at Algiers Point. And it's really interesting because you can take the ferry and cross the river and you can be right in the French Quarter from my house. And um, when I evacuated, um, I stayed away for about two or three months in Florida. I was in, in um, Florida with my wife and my son. And uh, we went back three months later. And um, Well, actually, I went back before then. And I had to rake up like 50 bags of leaves. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't forget it, man. It was like, I said, there's a house here somewhere. <laughs> but what no was, water. What was covering your house? Leaves. Like, I oh, had like leaves. leaves like, oh. I live under these oak trees. I mean, uh -huh. it's a beautiful street. It's like this yeah. avenue, and it's like these 300 year old oak trees. Huh. Some of them fell, obviously, from yeah. the wind breaking, but. What happened was all of the wind just pushed all the leaves on my front porch. <laughs> it was incredible. I'm telling you, man, I couldn't. I had to like open a gate, move a tree branch, move the leaves out of the way. I'm, it wow. was is incredible. And open up my front door, and and I was thought I was gonna you know smell this wretched smell coming through my house. But what happened was the electricity went off, but it was turned back on. So the refrigerator was still cold. Be darned. This was just like one of these freak things, and maybe I had like um, you know a couple of tiles off of my house, and that was it. You know, decorative tiles on my roof. That was it. I mean, everything, nothing. I mean, I was thankful. Wow. I mean, in relation to everybody else who lost everything, my parents lost their houses. My sisters lost their houses. Um, I only had one brother, believe it or not, who lived in part of town that really flooded, but his house was fine. And, um, but it was, it was unbelievable. Truly, I mean, until you see it for yourself or saw it for yourself during that time, you would have thought an atomic bomb had been dropped in New Orleans. It was just that bad, you know, when, when I came back. But now the city is, 
in a recovery mode. And actually part of my teaching was, was that I said, well, let me go back to see how I can help the yeah. city deal with what we've lost because there was, we truly lost a lot of musicians. I mean, there's people like the Nevilles who say they're never going back, you know. Mm. Yeah, they just said they're never. Some of them said that they're not going to go back, mm. you know. And so we were, we're at a crossroads, for lack of a better definition, in terms of our culture, in terms of our infrastructure, in terms of where we are, where we were then, and even where we are now. How do we rebuild? That question, as you know, is still yeah. just sort of being flushed out there. Right. And so... Um, so to make a long story short, um, <laughs> or a short story longer, <laughs> uh, we're in a very interesting place right now in terms of the, the city. And uh, maybe this might be one of those statements, you know, as New Orleans go, maybe as America will follow. You know, what do we, what do we value? You yeah. know, what do we really truly value about our I think our individuality about our music, about a lot of things. I think in this conversation, a lot has been lost because even though you might hear about the type, the kind of poverty that existed in New Orleans during Katrina, which was terrible, and no, you have to acknowledge that the educational system, uh, breakdown in infrastructure, a lot of people don't realize that New Orleans was, was, was where one of the first operas was performed in the United mm -hmm. States. Obviously, you know, the birth of jazz, it was a, an investment banking center at one time, one of our most important ports. There was a lot of history that happened yeah. in New Orleans that we sort of forget about in terms of the birth of this nation. You know, and so sort of like in this renaissance or this rebirth that we, ha we have to go through, I hope that, you know, the United States understands that um, New Orleans still has something to offer. Now, what that is, we have to define that in terms of how we grow out of this because it's gonna it's gonna be a growth process I'm telling you I mean you know maybe you, you go down there and you really see it for yourself because it's still in a, some way I don't know if you saw the Spike Lee film or saw portions of it but it is really a devastating experience it's just to see entire neighborhoods wipe, wiped off mm. the, the the face of the earth you know and um, for me you just have to say, well, what can I do? What, what can I think of? What can I do creatively? You know, we, we, and that's sort of like, which, which is interesting about the situation where we are now, because we did the camp in New Orleans, and we had half the students, and now we're up here teaching kids. So, you know, we, <laughs> yeah. we still have something yeah. to offer. Yeah, you know, all absolutely. is not lost. But it is a really um, wrenching kind of a thing, you know, mm -hmm. just for people who have, Seriously, lost everything. I mean, and it, it, I mean, sometimes you know we, we we think about it in terms of the material possessions, but I'll give it a, an example. Um, entire families who lost photographs. Yeah. So how do you, you know what I mean? How do you get? How do you give that back to somebody? You know, you can give them a house, you can give them a car, you can give them all of the things that make them function. But when they sit back. You know, they start talking about the photographs that they lost or the house where they grew up in, that their mothers, grandfathers, and you've done all these things. You know, you, you just can't, you know what I mean? That's something yeah. that, an emotional tie that you have to figure it out. You have to figure it out because there is, there was something lost, but then there's something that has to be either gained or regained again. And that's sort of like what we're going through right now. Well, probably it will definitely look, be different, and I, I hope it's better. You know, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. It comes out with a, a character. Like you said, maybe the, the country can follow the character mm -hmm. of that place yeah. somehow. Yeah, somehow, you know, we can, we can get back to, um, I don't know, <laughs> it's just, for me, music is just real. You know, it has to have a certain, not a surrealness about it, but a realness about it that can make you feel something you know, really make you feel something. Um, and I hope that we can regain that. Because, I mean, truly, I can tell you, there was certain things that were happening even musically. As great as, it, as great as it is musically, there were certain things that were not happening that needed to happen musically, mm -hmm. that we needed to, in a way, refocus on, you know, refocus in on and, and try to find that, that verve again, try to find that, that character again, you know, because yeah. we were just sort of like, 
just floating out there, <laughs> you know, not really taking care of the kind of business that we need to take care of. But I'm not talking about business in the sense of business sense, but yeah. in the sense of, you know, great musicianship, playing in tune, <laughs> reading music, you know, <laughs> fundamental things that my dad talks about all the time. That was being lost, I'm telling you. It was wow. just, you know, you go listen to a marching band in New Orleans and it sounded like, man, where are these? Where's the craftsmanship? Yeah, where's right? the craftsmanship? Yeah. You know, where's the yeah. musicianship? Yeah. You know, what are they learning? You see, I'm telling you, man, a long time ago with these band directors, you have to play in tune. You have to play c c correctly. You have to good posture, good musicianship. I mean, man, it was just like, I'm sure if you, if you haven't, just ask any New Orleanian New Orleanian about Yvonne Bush. I don't know if you've ever heard it, but she was a preeminent band director who taught all of the musicians in New Orleans. From everybody who played with Fast Domino <laughs> hmm. to, you know, Ellis Marcellus, Harold Baptiste, I mean Yvonne Bush. I'm telling you, man. And so when you sort of lose that kind of direction in terms of what you're doing. And these kids are going to these these schools and not really learning, and, you know, like they, like what you said, the craftsmanship. You, you have a lot is lost. Mm. A lot is lost. So, you know, we're trying to find our way. Well, I hope you play a, an important role in all that. And I have a <laughs> feeling you will yeah. somehow or other. Well, what's new for me, I, and I just put this in the archive. I'm I'm trying to actually work on my flute and strings project. I like mm -hmm. to put that out there again. And, uh, something new. I'm really been um, a while since I've done it and um, obviously I'm doing things with my family you know Marlon and my sister Stephanie yeah. and Rachel we, we're doing some things and um, so hopefully we'll be up here soon That's with great. Marlon so yeah doing that. Well it's been a great uh, time for me to have, have this conversation with you. I oh appreciate I appreciate it. it. Thank All you right. very much. Thank you. <laughs> Stay <laughs>